Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy B. I'm an alcoholic. I do better sitting down. I want to thank the committee for inviting me back. I seem to be a permanent fixture at the Florida State Convention, and uh, it's uh, (laughs) a—and it's um, a lot of fun. And I wanted to say that, um, you know, I travel around a lot, and there's a lot of people in here that go to conventions all over the place, and I've been to a lot of your home groups. So I see you often, and uh, I don't think I've ever really thanked you all for being so kind to me. It really means a lot to me that you come up and you say hello. A lot of you sent cards when my daughters went a couple years ago, and I, I don't get a chance to thank each one of you personally, but it really means a lot to me that uh, I see your faces and we're all still sober, and and it means a lot. So I just wanted to tell you that. Let's see. I uh, got sober on uh, December seventh, nineteen sixty four, and I got sober up in the Washington D.C. area, and um, I was there for I guess how long was I there? Um. I don't know, but down here is 16 years. I guess I was there 35 years, and then I came down here. Um, I found AA very similar in both places. A lot of people move, and uh, they go, well, it's so different here than it was. But I found it very similar. I found that both places were very enthusiastic. Uh, you the you handed the chips out incorrectly here. That was one mistake. <laughs> and uh, in Tampa started all their meetings at 8:15. Now they've since changed it to seven and other times. And I in D.C. they were all at 8:30. And and when I'm saying they were all at 8:30, they were all at 8:30, and they just stayed that way for many many years. And then in the modern era people had the audacity to change AA and they would start one at seven or they'd start a noon meeting and old timers would go, what the hell are you doing? You're ruining AA. <clears throat> but I was always curious how in God's name Tampa got all their meetings at 8.15. I mean, 8.30, 9, 8, but 8.15, that would be like 8.12 or something like that. And I've never heard an answer on that, except my guess is that the original old-timers, one of them said, what time should we have our meeting? He says, I don't get out of work till 7.15, 8.15 is the earliest I can be there. Okay. So then anybody who started a meeting, well, I guess we start them at 8.15, so we better do that. And it's amazing how things like that uh, start, and 35 years later, we're still chugging along under the same... Thing, thinking that there was a very good reason for it. <clears throat> I grew up in um, New Haven, Connecticut, and I was born in 1931. And uh, when I was 10, uh, World War II started, and uh, they had a big polio epidemic, and I got polio. And the, uh, that was back when doctors made house calls. So our family doctor came out, and I remember him coming in, and I was very sick, and I couldn't bend my neck, and, you know, your muscles all tighten up. So he had a long talk with my parents out in the hall. You know when you're left out of the conversation, there's something serious going on. And they came back in, and then they said, well, you're going to have to, uh, go in the car right now, go down to the hospital, and they pushed you into the um, 
quarantine area and nobody could come in there. And for the first day, it was kind of scary. And the funny thing is, kids are really funny. We were all scared the first day. And then the second day, the joker in the crowd started making us all laugh. And uh, then the next guy was doing this. And then we were playing games on how to trick the nurse. And you could only visit out the window in the parking lot. So we had secret messages would would have little airplanes and send a message down to our parents and so it, it was amazing how fast this group united and um picked up the spirits of everybody i'm making the comparison to aa you had this, this big threat but you had a group handling it so that you felt pretty good about things and uh, after a month or so, that I don't know how they divided this all up, but they sent a bunch of us up to Newington, Connecticut, to the Newington Home for Crippled Children. So this was already had all these children that had a lot of problems, and in came the polio people. And once again, it was scary for a while, but then I started watching these kids that had been there forever. And I remember seeing one kid run up and down the stairs on crutches. One crutch in front of him. I mean, he was going faster than people with regular legs. And I'm sharing this because there were just so many inspirational things. And I remember my parents, uh, in order to visit, this is, uh, I'm thinking back about World War II, they had to wait to get an increase in their ration cards on their gasoline. So they had enough gasoline to drive up there because each family had a, you got these little coupons. And when you went to get gas, you turned them in. When you ran out of coupons, you didn't get any more. And it was very limited unless you were a doctor or something like that. And so I remember when they finally were able to come up and it was kind of nice. <clears throat> and I was one of the lucky ones that the Sister Kenny treatment worked for. There weren't that many. It was a nun that came up with this treatment where you were, um, they put heat on your, I couldn't even move this arm or right leg, and they put heat on there, and then they moved it around in a certain way for physical therapy. And I got my leg came back 100%, and my arm came back about 90%. But it left a um, atrophy in the back, and there's a hole back here. And I have a story about that hole. Uh, when I was taking my flight physical, I had never told, you know, if you tell anybody you had polio, you're not even going to get in the Marine Corps. So I did not check the box. <clears throat> I don't know if I still would. <clears throat> so I'm taking the flight physical uh, to get into the uh, Naval Aviation uh, flight program, and the doctor's I can feel him, he's pushing in my back, and he comes to this hole, and he goes, hmm, I could hear him make that noise, and his finger was in there. And he said, what's this? And I said, I don't know. And I heard him poking and going, hmm, hmm. And then he took his hand out, and he said, okay. If it had been a different doctor, I never would have got to flight school. I I look back, and you know, there's events like that, all throughout our lives where it could have gone entirely different. And uh, about a, six months later, I was a, I almost drowned as a kid, so I had a hard time swimming. And it, we had to pass a test. I did okay with the underwater things, and they jump you in and the parachute, and then they dump you upside down in the cockpit and all that. But this one was you had to swim up and down the pool for a half a mile. I was so tense in the water that I got, I would just burn out energy. So my class had all passed it, and I was going every night back to the pool, and this um, seaman third class Navy guy, and he and I were the only ones there, and he'd go, okay, come on, Lieutenant, you can make it tonight. So I'd get in the pool, <laughs> I'd start swimming. He said, try the side stroke, try this. And so I'm trying, trying, it came down the last night, and I'm going, I'm going, I'm looking at the clock. You had 30 minutes or something like that, and I realized I had one minute to go, and I had two laps. 
you're not going to get that done. So I finished the one lap, and I just put my head down in total disgust, and he came over and he said, nice going, Lieutenant, you made it. Now, if that had been a different guy, I wouldn't have got through flight school. I guess he just said, this guy's trying so hard, I'm going to give him a one free lap. And I, I often wonder how nice it would be to find these people and thank them. They probably had no idea what a effect they had on our lives, and I'm sure all of you have had little angels that showed up and gave you a hand. Anyway, um, I don't think my childhood was that different from everybody else's. I think um, childhoods are designed to um, get us off on the wrong, tra wrong track <coughs> so that we have to be rescued later. <laughs> and that goes for everybody. It's not just alcoholics. It's just that we get off on the wrong track and then really get off on the wrong track. And like many people, I had an experience with church where I found it intimidating, and my sister sat next to me, and she loved it. And this happens so many times, and, and we don't realize at the time that it's our perception that's causing the problem. We think this church or whatever school or whatever it is, is a terrible place because it's making us feel so uncomfortable. And I felt guilty, and I felt threatened, and and the whole thing just um, completely overpowered me. The incense and the confession and the Latin, I didn't know what they were saying. They were going to, they could be talking about me before I knew it. The bad little boy is here again, but we have plans for him. And as I said, my sister sat next to me and just loved it. And she, she died last year with 35 years sobriety. And she went to that church. I went to her funeral, and the priest was uh, 35 years in AA. And I got to talk to him, and he's uh, thinking of coming down to visit in Tampa. And it was quite a nice experience. And so as, as the more uncomfortable I got, the more I was looking out there to see what was causing it. And out there is you. You're the ones out there, and I don't, and I don't know why, but you were trying to make it so that I couldn't win. And I couldn't succeed. And you made me very nervous, and you made me very uncomfortable and you had a conspiracy going, you all knew what was going on, and you wouldn't tell me. You were all comfortable, you all had a million friends, and I didn't. And I didn't think it was fair, and I was just, I was just racking my brain on how I could change the world so that it would be comfortable for me to be in it. And I was totally unsuccessful until I found alcohol. And in an instant, I found the power to change the world that I lived in. Just like that. Two and a half drinks, and people that were intimidating became friendly. They didn't want to know me. Now they could. They were begging to know me. They were looking at me like, God, if I could only know you, I would, my whole life would change. And I just, I could feel it, and I just ran around trying to meet all these people, and all my fear, my inhibitions were gone. This is on two and a half drinks. Solved every problem I ever had. I'm 19 years old, and I suddenly found the answer to everything. I found the answer to everything in a 15-minute period. And I knew that I didn't have to seek anymore. I didn't have to look any further. Game over. Booze. And God, you know, it, it was so powerful. I'd sit in the classroom. I was still in college. And I'd be uncomfortable. I'd be having a hard time. But I'd go six more hours. And then it would be the afternoon, three more hours. And so just knowing that in three hours I was going to go into Alice in Wonderland made the day a little more easy to handle.
two more hours, one more hour, 30 minutes, bingo. And then you start walking down the street. I don't know about you all, but as the bar came into view, you know, the neon sign, I started, I'd stand up straighter. I don't even have any alcohol in my system and I'm feeling better. Yeah, there it is, coming in. It was just amazing. And I'm, I'm just dying for a drink. My system really needs a drink. And I come in and the bartender comes over and he says, what do you want? And I said, this man was here first. Wait on him. And my body's going, are you kidding? <laughs> we have an emergency down here. What are you <laughs> What are you telling him to wait on him first? You know, how, remember how grandiose we were and all that? And then finally when he finished with him, I said, give me a triple. Ah, then everything settled down and uh, you know our big book says our problems were removed well that's not new to me probably isn't new to you you take in all those problems into the bar and then the third drink mm -hmm. and somebody would ask you what about all those problems you were talking about oh, forget the problems let's live in the now <laughs> <laughs> Got to live in the present moment, man. Eat, drink, and be merry. You know, tomorrow we could be dead. Well, I hear you only have half the rent money, and it's due tomorrow. I said, Yeah, let me. Everybody have a drink. We'll spend it all tonight. <laughs> and we'll worry about the rent money tomorrow. But today, we're going to live today to the to its fullest. And didn't we do that? God, we really had this. Um, AA program down to a pat while we were drinking not that our amends were sincere <laughs> the thing I relate to in the in the uh, big book when they're talking about the actor he said he was um, he was self-serving even while he was trying to be kind I always related to that trying to be kind. In other words, when you're self-centered, you don't know what kind is. It's impossible to be kind when you're self-centered. But you hear that kind people are admired. So you ask around, well, what do kind people do? And then we learn it, so then we do it. And we act, we do some kind-looking things. But people see through us and realize we're doing it in order to get something. And um, I just related to that, not knowing what these words really meant, what it meant to be kind and unselfish. We were self-seeking while we were being unselfish. If I was being nice to you, I had a motive. I was going to ask you for a favor next week. So I'd butter you up first. But I wasn't saying it to make you feel good, and I wasn't saying it because I meant it. I was saying it because I saw a way of advancing my what I needed to get done. And, of course, when uh, geez, uh, it was a shock when um, my sponsor said self-centeredness is the root of our problems. And I went, self-centeredness? I thought money was the root of my problems. I didn't, um, I had six kids and I'm broke and we're in a lot of trouble. And he's saying self-centeredness. And I remember going, self-centeredness? What the hell is self-centeredness? And he said, well, a self-centered person thinks about themselves all the time. I said, well, yeah, I do that. And then they said, they see everything in relation to them. They're the center of everything. And I'm going, yeah, so what's wrong with that? I, don't, I mean, that's... So it started sinking in how self-centered I really was, and it was a shock. It was, it, was, it was just devastating. And I said to my sponsor, I'm embarrassed to tell you how self-centered I am. I, I thought about it last night, and it, was, it just overpowered me. But don't worry, I'm going to fix it. Only a self-centeredness, self-centered person would try to fix self-centeredness on their own. 
He said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, I'm going to become unself-centered. And he says, how do you do that? I think you stand over there. I'm not sure how you would become. And it turns out you cannot become unself-centered on your own. Now, whatever you do, you're still self-centered. So our program offers us the answer. And the answer is to become God-centered. And when we do that, we are now at the real center and everything looks different. And that's why Chuck Chamberlain talks about a new pair of glasses. He's talking about the transformation from self-centeredness to God-centered and how different everything looks. That transformation that we do, it occurs more slowly here in AA, but it's very similar to the transformation of the third or fourth drink. Everything suddenly looks different and we feel different about it. We're more comfortable. Remember when that fourth drink, just, yeah, I just looked around the whole bar. Sometimes after four drinks, I would look at the customers in the bar and I'd start crying because of the quality of people that were there in the bar. <laughs> the, their spirituality and their wholesomeness overcame me. I just wanted, I was so lucky to be there. Now, ten drinks later, there were serious fistfights and name-calling and all the wonderful people left. But at that moment, I would just be overcome with the magnitude of the situation. Anyway, uh, very briefly, I did most of my drinking in the Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps with five other guys in college the, the Korean draft was still on and so they all were drinking beer and said why don't we join the Marine Corps I said, yeah for hell yeah and I finished my beer and we went directly down to the recruiting office which wasn't that far away and that recruiting sergeant was thrilled six guys all at once came in and said we want to join the Marine Corps okay boy he signed us all up and then uh, each we didn't all stay together but we all had the same experience of finding out how the Marine Corps welcomes you. It's a very interesting indoctrination into the family. And after six months of training, I fell in love with it. I just, I don't know what it was, maybe it was the discipline, maybe it was the fact that we all were on the same team, but I really loved it and I saw a movie about pilots and I thought that looked even better. I signed up for flight school. I made it down here to Pensacola. I got married. I, I went through flight school in uh, 18 months. Uh, I was still drinking but there was so much excitement and so much studying and so many things to be doing that the drinking was mostly on weekends. I don't know how it got subdued long enough to go through and get reasonably high grades and uh, not have any accidents. <laughs> Part of that is luck. And um, and eventually, in Corpus Christi, Kingsville, Texas, we got into jets and got our wings and got sent to El Toro, California, for Marine Corps fighter training in the old F-9s. Those, those old people might remember the Cougars and the Panthers from Korea, the blue jets that were in the bridges on Tokori, and that was a neat little airplane. And uh, living on Balboa Island wasn't bad either. And we traveled up to El Toro, and at the time, between Balboa Island and El Toro was almost solid orange groves. There was a big canyon, and we drove through it. And I think I told this story recently, but I, I still get a kick out of it. They were opening Disneyland, which was right near El Toro. And I remember being in the club with this other guy, and he said, they're opening Disneyland. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, they got this thing over right around the corner. They built a castle, and Mickey Mouse is in the parking lot, and he greets everyone. I said, Mickey Mouse greets everyone? Who the hell is going to go see Mickey Mouse? I mean, well, I would know. I mean, it sounded preposterous. So, so we had a couple more drinks and we said, let's go over. So, 
So we drove over, and it was early, and the, that parking lot must have held 5,000 cars. I don't know. It was enormous, but one little corner had cars in it, and the rest didn't. And there was some little tram or something that took us out. There's Mickey. Hi. And I'm going, Jesus. And there was a castle, and it looked like there was some rides, and I said, Mickey, where do you get a drink around here? <laughs> And he said, uh, we don't have alcohol in here. See you later, Mickey. And we, <laughs> and we, went, we were driving out of the parking lot, and I remember my buddy and I both said, if Walt Disney thinks he's going to fill that parking lot, he's got another thought coming. So I wrote off Disneyland as a terrible idea. That's why I didn't succeed in business. <laughs> so we went overseas, and the war was over, and I had a great time. met a lot of wonderful people. I had 14 years in the Marine Corps. I lost my career to drinking, which I regret very much, but I got AA out of it, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I think I've mentioned this... Um, I didn't get promoted to major. You have to get promoted if you're going to stay in for 20 years. So I had 14 and didn't make it the first year, didn't make it the second year, so now I'm out. It's just a deal. You get an honorable discharge, but you're gone. And I uh, had been going to meetings every night, and now I'm, on, I'm out in the dirt with my six kids. And I was uh, thinking about it at home. I didn't want to when you have these deep problems, you don't want to bring them up to your sponsor. He'll take them away from you. <laughs> he won't let you think about them at all. And if you can't think about them, you can't turn them into huge events. So according to my way of thinking, going to a meeting every night for two years and getting thrown out of the Marine Corps meant that God hated me. This new God that I'm going to trust. And I'm going to go. So I was very upset. I was just like, beside myself. Meeting every night, thrown out of the Marine Corps. But they just didn't go. And I remember going to meetings. Somebody say, anybody got a topic? I never raised my hand to have a topic. I haven't done it in 40 years. But I raised my hand that night. They said, well, what topic do you want to talk about? And I said, getting thrown out of the Marine Corps. Sandy, that's not a good topic. It's not really something anybody... I don't care. It's my topic, and it's driving me crazy. I don't want to hear that. I, want to, I need some feedback. And I figured once I announced I was being thrown out of the Marine Corps that AA would help me. Somebody with a corporation would go, are you available? I have a vice president slot in marketing... 50000 a year, expensive car, and a Buick, would that be all right, Sandy? Would we help you out? Something like that. I, I would consider good advice. But the advice I got was um, very strange. It was, um, uh, just say the serenity prayer. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> Double up on your meetings. you got a lot of time. <clears throat> help new people. Take your mind off yourself. Say the prayer of St. Francis. He took a vow of poverty. And um, I went home that night and I said, I did not explain my situation very clearly <laughs> to get advice like that. Serenity prayer, double up on your meetings. Little did I know that it matters not what the problem is. That's what you're going to hear. You could be, find out you're going to die. You could just get divorced. You could just have, lose a leg in an accident. Just lost a leg in an accident. Oh, say the serenity prayer. <laughs> Double up on your meetings. We'll get your wheelchair. <laughs> Help the new person. Don't feel bad about yourself. Prayer St. Francis. I mean, so we know one thing that um, in AA we just have one solution for all problems. 
And it's a very powerful solution that involves God. And it's um, been going on for a lot of years. And we should be used to that because before we got here, we had one solution for all problems. I don't ever remember saying to myself, oh my God, here's a terrible situation I won't be drinking over. <laughs> this one I'll handle sober. I didn't know how to handle a situation sober. I had no idea how to handle anything. So I got a warrant or something, and when the mails show up at the sheriff's or whatever it was, I was panic-stricken. I said, what do you do when you get this? What do you do? I don't know, but I will shortly. Go out to the kitchen. One, two, three. Let's see. Tear it up. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> But I made a decision. I mean, you just... <clears throat> so eventually, I lost, uh, as I said, I lost that career. I ended up in a mental institution. That's where I found AA. And the biggest gift I got out of all of this was my sponsor. And I'm like Bob. We had sponsors for a long time. Yours was how many? 45? 43, and mine was 42 years. And what a blessing to have a relationship with someone that long. And eventually you become friends. And we just um, helped each other with problems. And I would call him, and he would call me. And if he didn't know the answer, he would call somebody with more sobriety. And I do that to this day. If somebody calls me and I don't know, I'll call Bob, I'll call Clancy, I'll call somebody, call Tom. And I'll go, have you run across this situation? And that's the beauty of this program. Our egos don't get in the way so that we have to come up with the answer ourselves. We're free to call somebody and say, I don't know, but I think I know somebody who does. Now, I don't tell them that I got the answer from someone else, but that's all right. <laughs> I like them to think their sponsor is infallible and wise and all that. But if they listen to this talk, they're going to be greatly disappointed. <clears throat> so Bill set me, Bill Twilliger was my sponsor, and he set me on this path. When you start on this path, you have no idea where it's going because you can't see beyond today. But we do have hints from people who've been here a long time. And they tell us marvelous stories of their early years and the challenges that they faced. And we look at them and they're living proof of the power of God. And so even though we don't have a connection with the higher power, we're forced into admitting that there's other people whose lives have been greatly affected by this spiritual connection. And so there's two forces that drive us towards this ultimate solution, which is a power greater than ourselves, that most of us end up calling God because a power greater than ourselves takes forever to say. <laughs> And even the strongest ego finally goes, okay, I'll use God. Mm -hmm. I know I'll look bad, but I'm going to finally say it. I said I'd never say it, but I'm going to say it. I think eight years is the record, if you're curious. And then you realize, I could have done that the first week. And so these two forces are, one is attraction... And one is alcohol. And alcohol is saying to us, if you don't change your mind and start to believe that there is something such as a power greater than yourself, you're going to suffer greatly. You are not going to make it. And that's the dilemma that's in the second step in the big book and the chapter of the agnostic. We have a spiritual illness which only a spiritual experience can conquer. 
And I remember reading that, and my sponsor wanted me to get the full impact of it. Do you see where you are? You have a spiritual illness. You have an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And I said, I don't believe in spiritual experiences. And he said, oops, you're screwed. We don't have a non-spiritual answer. And I said, well, then what's going to happen to me? You change your mind. You get rid of your old stupid ideas that there's no such thing as spirituality and there's no such thing as a higher power, and you get an open mind and you find out what happens. Nobody's saying you have to believe right now. All you have to do is accept the reality of your situation, which is... You better change your mind soon or something bad's going to happen. It's almost like the mafia comes up and says, why don't you start praying? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We were made a deal that we couldn't turn down. And that's when I just said, all right, okay, okay, what do you want me to do? I want you to have an open mind about a higher power, and I want you to try praying. And I'm going, praying to what? To whatever will hear it. Okay, I'm going to try praying. And I remember praying. And one of my prayers was, I pray that prayer doesn't work. Because if it does, I'm going to look bad. I've been bad-mouthing prayer for 25 years. What if I pray and it works? Everybody will go, ha-ha, you're a jerk, ha-ha, I didn't want it. I didn't want to experience that. Isn't that silly? Our pride just going, I hope prayer doesn't work. Well, we all know that eventually prayer has an amazing power on us. First of all, it's blocking out the normal negative thinking that is sitting there all the time. And the second thing it does, it calms us down to the point where we start to realize that maybe there's something else present that we weren't aware of. We don't know what it is, but we're starting to have an awareness that there's something around us that's been there all along that we hadn't noticed before. I sometimes remember back in the old days when the hotels had reading rooms. And if you're waiting for somebody, you could go in there. They had a lot of nice books and big easy chairs, and you could just pick a book out and wait for the train to come in with your friend or whatever it was. And so I remember going in there and looking around, and I said, wow, I'm the only one in here. And I got a book, and I'm reading about 20 minutes. Suddenly I realized there was someone else in the room. And I got up and looked around. By God, there was. There was a guy back in the corner that I hadn't noticed before. So I sat there for 20 minutes, and then I became aware that someone else was there. To me, that's kind of how God appears. I suddenly become aware that there's something else going on that I wasn't aware of before. But I cannot experience this awareness when I'm disturbed. I can't be angry and resentful and all that. So that's why our steps are designed to help us get rid of all these things that are causing a disturbance so that we can finally become aware of our true nature, or at least the beginning of it. And I think it's captured so well at the end of the promises when it says we suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. To me, that's the best description of a spiritual awakening. Here you are. You've had no clue about God at all. Maybe you got about 10 months. Maybe you got two years. And you suddenly realize that God's doing all this. It's not a bunch of coincidences. You were personally contacted, and you had this experience And this experience is AA's definition of God. Until you have the experience, it's just a theory. After you have the experience, it's a certainty. 
and that's in the beginning of the big book, the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way that's indeed miraculous. So it's no longer faith. It's beyond faith. It's certainty. It's, it's an awakening. It is a spiritual experience, very personal. And so if you're new, this is the target. Sobriety isn't the name of the game. This spiritual experience is the name of the game. If you want to get sober, punch a cop. You'll have 30 days sobriety before you know it. So <laughs> Now, we have to stay sober in order to have the spiritual experience. And we can do that with the meetings and our friends and, and all of that. But this is the turning point, the transformation that takes place in everyone. And the reason it's so important is when these transformations take place and we can maintain them, there's nothing for alcohol to fix. And if there's nothing for alcohol to fix, it's pretty easy to just not drink. What do I need a drink for? There's nothing for it to fix. Or I know I can fix this without alcohol. I'll call my sponsor. He'll give me the way out of this. I remember when my daughter was murdered and I got all the cards from all you people and I had had the experience of seeing other people handle this and how they forgave the person right away and how they went to God and, and assured God that this would not change how they felt about him. Those lessons were implanted in me 20 years earlier and they all paid off and were very, very powerful. So the program enables us to be reasonably comfortable through any situation that life gives us. And then we can serve as an example for the next person coming along who's going to encounter the same situation. Now, the most important thing is, of all these things, as I'm getting down to the end of the time, is to make sure that while this is all happening, you have a tremendous amount of fun. So if you're in a home group where they don't laugh, get the hell out of there now. <laughs> Whoa, no, no. You don't want to stay there much longer. I remember <laughs> we, had a, we had a bunch of pilots when I got sober. This guy was a World War II pilot and was a prisoner of war with the Nazis. And I think he gave them so much trouble they released him or something. He was just a terrible guy. And his adage was, you know, when he'd wrap up his talks, he was a very dynamic, big guy. And then we all went to hear these lawyers. They were funny as hell. And uh, he would wrap it up with, okay, here's the thing. If you're new, don't drink, go to meetings, do the steps, get a higher power, and stay the hell away from the sad asses. That was his... <laughs> And I think that's damn good advice. Because this is, when we think of our theme, the joy of living, when we think of we absolutely insist on enjoying life, we're not a glum lot, this is designed to enable us to deal with life-threatening situations. Alcoholism is a fatal disease with a lot of fun while we're doing it. And we laugh at ourselves and we tell stories about how stupid we were and the crazy things that we did. And everyone in the room laughs because they did crazy things. <laughs> and we're not doing them anymore. And we're so happy that the co-founders gave us this gift that we're going to pass on to many, many people in the future. And it's been an honor being with you all. And I thank you all for being my friends. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.